I'm going to be teaching in a few moments a very important message. Before I do, I'd like to give you a little review of seven. I want to talk to you for a few moments on seven immediate rewards of tithing. Before we get our message today, seven immediate rewards of tithing. Because it seems so futuristic when we talk about the blessing and the harvest. And we forget that what we've just received is a harvest. The fact that we have something as proof a harvest exists because we got it. If you look around your house, you got a harvest. Anything that blesses you is your harvest. Bo, your wife, is your harvest. Solomon is a harvest. Anything that blesses you is a harvest. So if you just look around your life, all you see is harvest. Your health is a harvest. There's people in the hospital today, your health is a harvest. You've got a job, somebody has perceived your distinctive gift and decided to write you a check for it. You're walking in the midst of harvest. A harvest is anything good that's happened to you. Love is a harvest. If you've found someone who, can, who thinks putting up with your weaknesses is worth it, that's a harvest. If you've found somebody who loves you with their whole heart, that's a harvest. The ability to speak when millions cannot is a harvest. Millions are deaf and hear no sound, hear no waterfalls, hear no music. Your capability to hear and distinguish sounds is a harvest. You could very easily be ugly. You have no idea how close you are to ugly. Just that nose, just a half an inch higher would make you a porky pig. You have no idea how easy it would be for God to let you be ugly. Look at someone said, look at someone next to you and say, you barely made it. You barely made it. You barely made it. You're closer to ugly than you could possibly imagine. It would shock you if you knew how easy it was for you to be ugly. Isn't it wonderful to even have people in your life who think you're pretty? You're handsome. Because there's a lot of folks who don't think you are. There's people who can't stand you. you so Mike, I thought this was going to encourage me today. No, there's people. There's people that just are shocked you found somebody to marry. Just say that out loud, God's been good to me. Oh, setting God has been good to me. You made it this far. Millions never made it this far. Millions never got this old. We made it. We're preserved. We're here. We're alive. We're well. But I want to talk to you about the immediate rewards of tithing that are very significant. Very, very significant. The first reward that I have found 
is that it silences satanic accusation. The first immediate reward from bringing the tithe, which is 10% of your income to the Lord, is that it silences satanic accusation. For those who may be unfamiliar, the Bible teaches, and you at your house there at Stream and Line, we're very, very thrilled that you've allowed us to come into your home through computer, and we hope that you'll watch us all day long, 2.30 at 2 o'clock this afternoon. We have prayer from 2 o'clock to 2.30 here. 2.30, we have our wisdom explosion when you'll hear from our pastoral staff that truly are explosive. They're, volcan they're walking volcanoes. And I know that, so we're letting them explode on Sunday afternoon, and it's worth your investment. Tithing started in the Bible when Abraham, in honor of a spiritual mentor and leader, a spiritual supervisor in his life, Melchizedek, King Melchizedek, to honor this man that represented God's presence on the earth and presence in his life, Abraham brought him a tithe, which means tenth, brought him back to honor his spiritual impartation. And it became a divine standard through scriptures. Later on, and when you get to Leviticus and others, it becomes the tithe is the Lord's. It's representative of our love for him. The tithe is proof of our respect for him. It's a seat of honor. We find in Malachi 3 where God became infuriated toward people who refused to honor him. He said, you've robbed me in tithes and offerings because I can't prove myself to you. The tithe is 10%. If you get paid $500, I know that 150 like goes to taxes and things like that, but the 500 that you receive, $50, is called holy money. It's the tithe. It's not rent for living on the earth. It's not the system for paying church expenses. The purpose of the tithe is not even evangelism or missionary work. The divine purpose of the tithe is to show honor to the source of every good thing. That after he's given us $100, we take the 10%, bring it back to him. And this is what he said his reaction would be. I will rebuke any devourer that comes against your life. He said that the tithe created a divine partnership that made him involved in every future event of your life. He said, I will open the windows of heaven. I will pour out a blessing that you don't have the energy or the time to even supervise. If you've got wrinkled clothes in your closet, it shows you got more than you can even take care of. Is your car unwashed? See, he gave you more than you can even take care of. If you have more than you can prioritize, organize, or supervise, you got more than you really deserve. You have so many books, you don't have bookshelves for them. They're on the floor. You've got more than you have room for. All through scripture and in Matthew, he picks it up again. The scum of the religious world was the Pharisees. They wore scriptures on their robes, prayed long prayers and fasted and were spiritual imbeciles, idiots, 
who despised Jesus. And this is how he referenced the tithe. He said, even, even Pharisees pay tithe. He looked at the lowest echelon of humans on the earth. Wasn't Zacchaeus. He looked at the lowest quality of humans that he saw around him. Humans that he warned his disciples about and said they're like whited sepulchers. And he says, even they, even they pay tithe. But you need to know that he promised specific rewards, and they're not all futuristic. They're present rewards. They're immediate rewards. They're seven. They're fascinating. Satan uses scripture to bring you into accusation. Remember in Matthew 4, the temptations of Christ, when he quoted scripture to Jesus? And said, throw yourself off the mountain. Didn't you say that you'd be raised? The, the scriptures even teach the Lord to raise you up. Remember that? When Satan used even scripture, my father calls it over conscientiousness. When he was telling about my sister Flo, who's our organist and her husband's on our pastoral staff, he said years ago to me, because Flo is real, you know, dot every I, cross every T. She's just real demanding of herself. She just wants everything. She's just, you know, she wants it to be perfect. She wants to live perfect. She wants to be perfect. And Danny made a statement about her. He said, Satan takes advantage of her conscientiousness. Satan will use even you not tithing to bring an invisible but very tangible accusation to you. You're not who you say you are. You're not who you think you are. You tell everybody you love God, but you keep the tithe. You steal the tithe. You go into his presence. And he will use this to hammer away. And the tithe immediately silences him. The accusation of greed becomes powerless. It frees you to spend money on yourself. You won't even feel good about buying shirts, ties, shoes, dresses. When you don't tithe, you subconsciously feel satanic accusation concerning your greed. You can't even enjoy what you're buying because the devil makes you feel such inner guilt. But when you have brought the tithe to the Lord, 90%, you can spend 90% the rest of your money on Cokes and candy. <laughs> Say hallelujah. It silences any demonic voice activated inside you. You shouldn't do this for this. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't buy this for yourself. You shouldn't get a manicure. You shouldn't get a pedicure. You shouldn't buy those shoes. But when you have returned to the Lord, the 10%, yes, sir. I can do any cotton picking thing I want to. I've got 90%. It's incredibly liberating. The second immediate reward, it plants the seed of expectation in your subconscious mind. It plants the seed of expectation in your subconscious mind. That's a current, it's a magnet.
I might as well focus on this today. This is becoming a message right now. I'll get to get to the other later. This is too, this is too rich in my spirit. You mind if I just make this the focus here? Is that okay? You go to the door. A little boy says, hi, I'm with the Boy Scouts. You don't want any chocolate chip cookies, do you? You say, no. Okay. Next day, little girl comes up. You go to the door. Hi, I'm Susie. I'm with the Girl Scouts. Would you like three dozen cookies or six dozen cookies? And you stare into the countenance of an excited little girl that wants to sell you cookies you don't even like, don't even need. And you go, you holler back to your wife, honey, do we want three dozen cookies or we want six dozen chocolate chip cookies? You have to be Hitler to tell a little girl no. Her enthusiasm is magnetic. Her excitement is tangible. For you to suffocate her joy, for you to let her walk away from your door with nothing, could, could you live with that? You couldn't live with that. I was walking to a store some weeks ago, and they had this little table, and they were all out there. You know, they're all a little cute. It's like little girls got all of them. <laughs> and they come up to me. I didn't even really like the cookies they had. <laughs> and I said, who am I going to give these cookies to? I'm, I'm going to get them, obviously. So I pulled out a $10 bill. Said, yeah, I'll take 10 of those. And the, oh, like a free circus on the spot because expectation is an aura. It's magnetic. It's excitement. It's a current. If you go into a store to buy something and the salesperson looks excited and anticipated, and they start early, don't they? They learn. They lay it all out so you feel obligated. Here, touch it. Here, just try it on. Don't hurt you. It don't cost you anything to try it on. What a lie. You know it's going to cost you something to try it on. You're not going to sit there and try all these clothes on, lay them all out on the table, and walk out with nothing. Not and feel good. So we come up with that famous exit line. Uh, I'm going to check on another place. I, I'll probably check back with you. Just to sort of lessen the doubt the, or the guilt. Do you understand the magnetism of expectation? That it's in the environment, that it's in the air? There's invisible gases in the air. We know that. We know that most of what we don't even see a lot that's out there. How can you call somebody on a telephone 10,000 miles away and there's no visible link? Because there is a link, it's you just don't see it. Expectation is just that tangible. When you have brought the tithe, I can't believe this was going to be a seven-minute talk. When you bring the tithe to the Lord, when you bring the tithe to the Lord, subconsciously, you birth instantly the seed of expectation. Because everything you do is to create a reaction. Everything. 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 I don't care if you're preparing a meal for the family. You want to hear some oohs and ahs. I love this. Mama, this is my favorite meal. We are in constant pursuit of reactions. We collect them and we segment people in our life relative to their reactions.
We stroke for a reaction. We smile for a reaction. You are one continuous seed sowing system. You are a con- you are a machine for reaction. We dress for reaction. We expect it. We practice smiles for reaction. We come in a hair for a reaction. You see women. You see women. And you think, you know what? If they just taped that up, they wouldn't have to keep. It's a reaction. Everything we do. The words we speak is for reaction. We are walking magnets expecting response. The incredible thing is that expectation is a magnet for what we want. Expectation is another word for faith. Expectation is another word for trust. Expectation is another word for confidence. One of the turning points of my life came one day, and I was in a motel room, and Brother Oral Roberts called me. And he said, Mike, I want you to write a song. Your miracle is coming towards you are going past you every day. And if you don't see it, you'll lose it. Well, obviously, it's not a singable line. You can tell that. There's not a, your miracle's coming towards you every day. If you don't see it, you'll lose it. What, one of, which one of those words do you rhyme with? I said, well, I have to give some thought to that, Brother Roberts. And let me get back with you. He said, well, Mike, we, we'd like for you to write it right now. He said, we're in the studio. We're here in television. And I've decided that's going to be my new theme song. I said, you're in the TV studio right now. He said, yeah, we're all sitting here. He says, you know, Evelyn's here. Here, Evelyn, get on the line. So she got on the other line. Hi, Mike. Yeah, we're here and we're recording. And, and, uh. You know, Oral, I said, well, you know, give me at least 15 minutes because I, I really don't really have a piano here in the hotel room. So I just tried to picture your miracle is coming towards you. Your miracle is coming towards you. Coming towards you, are going past you every day. And so I said, you know, I got to have a little time to sort of <laughs> sync myself up. I said, is this is this a real is this really important to you? And this is what he said: one of the greatest humans that ever walked, most significant rare men of God of the world who's n- no one's never done what he's done. Nobody. He said, if you and Richard were standing beside my bed and I was dying and I was about to die, the last sentence on my lips would be, your miracle is coming towards you or going past you every day. And if you don't see it, you'll lose it. Well, shoot, you know, if he's on the deathbed and this is his last words. So, so, oh, shoot, okay, okay, I'll, I'll. Now, I always, I'm a Louisiana boy, my, my, my English was my worst class. Can you believe that? English, my worst class, I'm writing books. But I pronounce towards as two words, T-O. W-A-R-D-S. 
why I can't learn foreign languages, because I work with log logic, and of course, there's no logic to language. Like sea, sea. Ocean, look, sea. So I pray, your miracle is coming towards you, because that's a rhythm, towards you. And so I called him back and was singing, your miracle is coming towards you. And he starts laughing. He said, it's towards, not towards. He said, who taught you English? I said, probably the same person taught you how to write songs. <laughs> your miracle is coming towards you, going past you every day. And I said, talk to me about this philosophy. I don't understand it. I said, are you telling me you've lost miracles? He said, thousands. Wait, Or Roberts has lost thousands? Shoot. If he's lost thousands of miracles, I've lost millions. <laughs> In the process of thought... I begin to understand that miracles are not explosive. Fourth of July Fort Work, for, uh, fireworks, noticeable events. They're silent, subtle, unknown, and unexperienced by everybody but the person who got them. I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference, right and wrong, evil and righteousness, difference in people, difference in a countenance, difference in a moment, like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? I'm so thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet telling others about it. And I hope you're getting, by the way, I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your MP3, every single day, two minutes of wisdom. Be a blessing. Sometimes I go a little over because I get excited. I want you to be a part of this ministry. I believe that when you get involved with God, he gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive, I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. The wisdom quick scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day, every single month of my life. There is no easier book to read than this quick scan Bible. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. Call me right now, plant your seed of 300 and watch God move. It dawned on me that the miracle of the blind man's sin was like a second 
And he's the only one that knew it. Only one that felt it. Nobody around him felt the drum roll. No trumpets, no trombones, no drums, no hand clap. Miracles. That's an exciting word. But only one person feels it for a split second. 'em leprosy then it's gone that's it now we preach about it for you <gasps> disappear seven seven but that's just you know he just got out of the water and skin's okay no drum roll no parade he said the secret it's like you're driving out a road and you tell your Wife, wow, that's a new building. I've never seen that building. She said, baby, that's been there for years. Really? No. Yeah, that's been, you just hadn't seen it. You've driven past 2nd Avenue, but never knew it was 2nd Avenue. How many people live in Halton City? Exactly. How many, no, give me the number of population. What's the population of Halton City? Come on, it's on the side, you see it? Starts with a three. Come on. Yeah. Come on. It's, 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 it's right everywhere. I want you to look at how many blind folks are in this one room. <laughs> blind folks in this one room. It's on the side. Five. You know, come on, come on, come on. You know, come on, five. There's five lit. You can't believe what we don't see. Why? We don't see it. How could you know what you don't see? But if someone says, 4th Street, look for 4th Street. Huh, there it is. You only qualify for what you see. Expectation. There's so much around you you're not seeing. Remember the book, The Law of Recognition? What I mentioned, I had all my emus running everywhere. They're like an ostrich. Same senseless chick, big chicken running everywhere. Had a camel out there and it was all flat land. And a friend says, why don't you have some fish ponds? A fish pond. I said, well, I heard my property's too little. He said, you could have more than one. And we end up with a bunch of fish ponds and all these fountains. And what's crazy is those fish ponds have been there for hundreds of years. Just had dirt in them. I had to get the dirt out. <laughs> My friend says, I don't know what we'll do with all the dirt. He said, we could make a little hill here. And you could, and he, and he pulled me up on his drag line, put me up in there, showed me what all, he said, you could watch all your animals across your property. You could sit right up here with a gazebo with you and your dad. I said, shoot. The hill, which I call Miracle Mountain, that hill's been there for hundreds of years. It was stuck over in the pond. <laughs> Say law of recognition. There's something you're not seeing and it's costing you. The benefit of tithing is that it unleashes a force, a current of expectation that nothing else births. When I tithe, expectation comes alive in me. What's God going to do now? I wonder where his favor is going to show up. Wow. Hallelujah. He's got some money now to invest for me. I wonder what's going to come. Expectation comes alive inside of you. That doesn't come any other way. The marvelous thing is your expectation is from a qualified source capable of responding to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, you don't expect your little six-month-old baby. How old is Solomon? Almost 11 months. 
you, do you give him your car keys and said, son, let's go, let's go, let's move it. Let's, you drive me. I'm, I'm going to read today. You don't expect something from him he can't perform. So you live life and you walk through life with muted expectations. You collect disappointments and create a philosophy and you systematize your life by your disappointments. So everything in our life dilutes this expectation energy. You ever walked inside a restaurant and says, knowing them, we'll take an hour before they get to us. You ever said that? Ham has ever sp spoken. And so you build a life with muted. Yeah, my husband said he'd be here at 6 o'clock. It'll be a miracle if he does show up at 6. It'll be 6.30 probably knowing him. He may not even show up for two hours. So you have gone through your life suffocating and killing expectation. Why? To avoid disappointment. All of your life is spent moving away from pain toward gain. Away from pain toward pleasure. So now we become developed. We become masters at killing expectation. So we go through life thinking if I can keep my expectation low, my, my disappointments will be few. Unfortunately, it'll work for you. I'm expecting a disappointment. <laughs> it happened. Just like I see it. I bet I can't get a parking place close to the, to the door. I bet I'll have to walk across the whole parking lot. Yep, it was right. And there's a certain amount of, I guess there's a certain amount of pleasure from being right even when it's bad. I was right. I think we try to bring that into the equation so even when we're disappointed, at least I was right. I knew they'd do it. But it's expectation that attracts the good things, the blessed things, the wonderful things. Because expectation becomes an invisible influence on others. An invisible influence on others. Let me show you the power of this because you've got to realize the tithe unleashes this dormant suffocating force called expectation. It uncorks it. It unleashes it. It unties it. It unwraps it. You've spent your whole life bearing this force all day so you can escape disappointment. And God says, I want to give you an exit. Hallelujah. I want to get you out of a pit of disappointment. I want, you, I want to wake up your expectations again. So whatever people have done, wherever there's been disappointment, I would like to equalize that and give you a chance at me. And let me show my difference from you. Let me show my distinction from people you know. Proof. I think it was Harvard or Stanford, Stanford University. They gave a test to children, told their parents, your children are extremely intelligent. We want to separate them from common children with ordinary IQs. We want to pre bring them into a class and train just them. So they brought the children in and told these children, you are not normal. You're incredibly intelligent. You're smarter than all these other kids and we don't want to mix you with common people. So we're putting you alone in a classroom and you're going to get a private teacher because you're super smart. And those children's grades soared to straight A's. Because they saw themselves as geniuses. The expectation of themselves was unwrapped. There's a lot to me. There's something there. I'm genius. I got an exceptional mind. And everything in their being rose to perform at its highest level because of the expectation.
what God arranged the tithe to do, and he showed us what we could expect. Honor the Lord with your substance. Your barns will be filled with plenty. What you going to start thinking? I'm getting, I'm getting blessed. Money's coming to me. Wow, I'm going to have creative ideas. Wow, I'm going to succeed. Well, I'm probably going to get a raise. I'm probably going to get money in the bank. There's no telling what's going to happen to me. And now you start looking. And the ideas you hadn't seen, huh, I was expecting you. There you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In my teaching on 26 keys to effective negotiation, it's a six-tape series, very powerful, from the book of Philemon, Paul writes to Philemon, and he says, I know, if you recall, Onesimus was a runaway slave that was a slave to a friend of Paul's by the name of Philemon. They end up in the same prison. While they're in prison together, Onesimus gives his heart to God under Paul. So Paul writes a little chapter for Onesimus to bring back to Philemon to persuade Philemon to receive him back, not as a runaway slave, but now as a brother. Paul transcends all class, all caste systems. And in a single paragraph in the Bible, which is the most fascinating Attorneys have told me they've used these six tapes over and over and it changed their whole presentation to juries. Paul, out of, if you count Hebrews, he wrote 14 books in the New Testament. It's the only book he starts off with Paul the aged because he creates a climate of compassion instead of force. Other places he said, Paul an apostle. I have a voice of authority. But when he write, went to convince Philemon, he takes the low road and he says, Paul the aged, I'm here in prison. And he creates a whole different environment. And he, he ends it. He says, by the way, I'm looking forward to coming to you. I'm going to spend some time at your house. I know you're going to even do more than what I'm asking you to do for Philemon. He speak. it is pregnant. It is pregnant with expectation. I know you're going to do this. I know you're going to do that. I know you're going to do this. I know you're going to do that. Expectation energizes you to pursue uncommon things, uncommon miracles. Expectation was what the woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years had to qualify her. If I can touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be made whole. Hallelujah. Expectation made the blind man rise above the restraints of his environment. When everybody around him said, shut up, be quiet. The Bible said, he cried the louder. Expectation is an energizer. Expectation destroys wrong voices around you. Expectation silences people who shouldn't even be talking to you. Expectation causes you to rise from the common level and move into the uncommon life. It's expectation. It was the secret of Donald Trump when he faced bankruptcy and he met with the bankers and said, let me tell you what I'm about to do. They said, okay. And he went from here back to his five billion. Expectation is electrifying. Expectation has an aura. Expectation has a fragrance. Expectation has an aroma. Expectation attracts right people to you. Expectation causes wrong people to become demoralized around you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Expectation silences voices of doubt. Expectation voice silences unbelief. Expectation. Expectation decides how you walk. Hallelujah. I asked one man why he was looking at the ground all the time. He said, I may find a nickel. I said, if you look up, you may find a dollar. <laughs> Say expectation. You will only 
achieve uncommon dreams and goals if you fuel and work with the force of expectation inside of your life. Hallelujah. You must develop it. You must move it into your conversation. You must move it into your talking. You must move it into your life. Expectation is not a dormant lake. It's a gushing, roaring Niagara Falls. Hallelujah. You can walk into a room and you feel expectation. Hallelujah. You said, well, what if there's none where I go? Then you take it with you. You change the environment. When you enter a room, you ought to decide what that room feels. Hallelujah. When you walk into a restaurant this afternoon, when you walk in, you change that environment. You are the essential ingredient in that equation. I don't care who's in that restaurant. When you walk in, expectation walks in. Faith walks in. Courage walks in. Your walking strength, weakness even gets excited when you walk in. <laughs> I said weakness even gets excited when you walk in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know of a more significant benefit of presentation of the tithe to God than the force of expectation that begins to permeate your being. First, you've got satanic accusation silenced. So his voice is weak. It's like a toothpick. Now you've got expectation. <sighs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Obedience always produces that. The third, it unleashes self-confidence to approach God. It unleashes self-confidence to approach God. Something inside of you is going to have to be abnormal to feel comfortable with God. First, you've got a history of your losses, weaknesses, bad decisions. So your walking history of imprints, everything bad's ever happened to you, now it's got the victim mentality developing in you. You've got so many things going against you. How do you walk in the presence of the king of kings? I'm not talking about an earthly president. I'm not talking about somebody flawed and happened to work a system that got them to the top. I'm talking about how do you talk to somebody that's never done wrong? How do you talk to somebody who has no weaknesses? How do you talk, how do you walk into somebody's presence and talk to the Heavenly Father who speaks and there's Jupiter and Neptune and Mars and it takes you a week to build a doghouse? Now, how do you develop a comfort level with someone of such extraordinary intelligence? How do you get along? What do you talk about to somebody who has no flaws. How do you talk to somebody who discerns your thoughts before you speak them? How do you talk to somebody who knows what you're gonna say before you say it and knows the hidden agenda? How, how, do, you, how do you keep looking at them? So good to have you today, so good. How? How do you enjoy somebody so different from you? So unlike you? How do you build a camaraderie? How do you create this zone? How can you be interesting to the person who made monkeys? Where do you search? Where do you search for fascinating, interesting words to someone who is 
the word who thought up a mouth. How do you talk to someone who speaks all languages and have some you hadn't heard? How do you become interested, interesting to someone who's easily bored? How do you keep his attention? Now, God is fascinated by boldness. Holy boldness. That's why when the woman says, he said, I don't give the dogs to eat. Now, how would you like for Jesus, who was God in the flesh, to look at you and reference you like a dog? I'm so sorry. And she comes back. Even the dogs get crumbs. <laughs> you got it. He, he that cometh unto him must believe that he is and that he reacts. He's a rewarder. He's a rewarder. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. If you come to God, you've got to come based on who he is. I know you're a rewarder. You got stuff laid up for me. You got plans for me. And they're not evil, but they're for good. Hallelujah. God, I know your nature. God, I want to talk. I want to talk to you. What in the world gives a person this kind of self-confidence that they're comfortable with deity? Hallelujah. I have brought him the price ticket for total obedience. You go to enter a restaurant, they say it costs 30 bucks. You pull out 30 bucks here. You go to buy a car, how much you need? Here. When you have followed an instruction, you get cocky. Self-confidence. No wasted energy scrambling to justify. Tithing unleashes a self-confidence to approach God. You said in your word, you would rebuke the devourer for my sake. You said you and I were partners. Hallelujah. That self-confidence is irreplaceable. Next. It immediately, the tithe immediately qualifies you to receive the anointing that flows through that house. The tithe immediately qualifies you to receive the anointing that flows through that house, that house of God. I'll give you a scripture. Ezekiel talks about the rules of the house. Moses said, God, I cannot handle all of this responsibility alone. God said, choose 70 men who respect your anointing, who expect my divine distinction in you, the empowering of me in you, and I'll take what's inside of you and I'll multiply it and it'll enter them. So every time I give you a miracle, I will give them a miracle. Every time I talk to you, Moses, that same anointing is going to work in their life. When I heal your son, I'll heal their son. The anointing that's on you is now on them. Because the anointing I respect is the anointing that increases in my life. The anointing I respect begins to increase in my life. Here at the Wisdom Center, you ought to expect your genius to explode and multiply. Because the wisdom of God is the focus of this house. You ought to expect the discerning inside of you. I'm going to make right decisions. Every decision I make is becoming better. You'll discern wrong people from right people. Wisdom is the ability to discern difference. 
difference between good person, right person. The difference between discerning a good investment from a wrong investment. You ought to expect because that's the focus of this ministry. When I walked onto the platform of, of Benny Hinn several years ago, when I walked on the platform in a, one of his meetings, the Holy Spirit says, plant a $10,000 seed in his ministry. My first instinct, you'll think this is a little funny, but my first instinct was to walk back down off the platform and walk back up again. I really did. That was my first to say, I want, I want to, I just, for sort of like an affirmation. That may not sound like a lot of money to you, but 10,000 is a lot of money. So I want to make sure it was not just some kind of some, you know, I picked up something God was telling somebody else around me because you can pick up things. So I'm sitting there and I'm just, oh my Lord, but I've learned to respond to his imprints. Quick, 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 quick. There is a reward for swiftness like there's a reward for completion. It's one thing just to complete an instruction, but there's another reward for diligence. He said a man that's diligent, a man that's quick, swift, a man that moves fast will stand before kings and leaders. Immediacy has a reward. Immediacy shows total trust. Delay shows doubt. Delay shows distrust. If I wait on following an instruction, it shows that now I'm bringing lockage, logic into the faith equation, which now neg negates or neutralizes my faith. Immediacy shows I can hear, I can move, I can make a decision, I'm trusting. Immediacy to respond to a God impression shows total trust. Delay documents distrust. I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference, right and wrong, evil and righteousness, difference in people, difference in a countenance, difference in a moment, like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? So thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet, telling others about it. And I hope you're getting, by the way, I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your MP3, every single day, two minutes of wisdom, be a blessing. Sometimes I go a little over because I get excited. I want you to be a part of this ministry. I believe that when you get involved with God, he gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive, I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. The wisdom quick scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day, every single month of my life. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. Call me right now, plant your seed of 300 and watch God move. 
When I walked onto the platform of, of Benny Hinn several years ago, when I walked on the platform in a, one of his meetings, the Holy Spirit says, plant a $10,000 seed in his ministry. My first instinct, you'll think this is a little funny, but my first instinct was to walk back down off the platform and walk back up again. I really did. That was my first decision. I, wanted, I, wanted, I just for a lot, sort of like an affirmation. That may not sound like a lot of money to you, but 10000 is a lot of money. So I want to make sure it was not just some kind of some, you know, I picked up something God was telling somebody else around me because you pick up things. So I'm sitting there and I'm just, oh my Lord. But I've learned to respond to his imprints. Quick, 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 quick. There is a reward for swiftness like there's a reward for completion. It's one thing just to complete an instruction, but there's another reward for diligence. He said a man that's diligent, a man that's quick, swift, a man that moves fast will stand before kings and leaders. Immediacy has a reward. Immediacy shows total trust. Delay shows doubt. Delay shows distrust. If I wait on following an instruction, it shows that now I'm bringing lockage, logic into the faith equation, which now neg negates or neutralizes my faith. Immediacy shows I can hear, I can move, I can make a decision, I'm trusting. Immediacy to respond to a God impression shows total trust. Delay documents distrust. The quickly you show. Now watch this. There is an anointing. Five days later, five days later, God gave me an answer to a prayer regarding healing I had prayed for, for probably 20 years on the fifth day of that $10,000 seed. Why? I sowed into that healing anointing. I sow into many kinds of anointing. Why? I want them to flow into me. The anointing I sow into is the anointing I reap from. The anointing I sow into is the anointing that increases in my life. There is an anointing of wisdom on this house. Hallelujah. There's an anointing for wisdom on this house. You ought to start expecting wisdom in your financial decisions, wisdom in your relationship decisions, wisdom in your investments. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is transferable. When Moses laid hands on Joshua, the Bible said the spirit of wisdom came upon him. Just say that loud. I receive the spirit of wisdom. Now this will be a little flesh talk, but let's do it. Say, I've never been this smart before. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. Oh, come on. Say it out loud. I've never been this smart before. I think you're going to believe it on the third time around. Say it again. I've never been this smart before. The intelligence of God is at work in me. The wisdom of God is like a volcano in me. I've never had this much wisdom before. My best decisions are about to be made. Hallelujah. Are we on number five coming up? Tithing instantly erases all consequences. Tithing instantly erases all consequences of past greed, past theft, and past ignorance. Tithing instantly erases all consequences of past greed, past theft, past ignorance. So you have a past, you have a history. You have a history of tithe that you didn't pay. You have a history of salaries you didn't pay tithe on. You made sales. You sold cars you didn't make a, you didn't tithe on. You sold land and houses. You got birthday gifts you never have tithe on. You, the, the, the slimy tentacles of the past are choking you. Tithing erases all the history of past mistakes. It's a done deal. 
I'm very aware of the 20% the Bible talks about in the Old Testament. If you have not tithe and you bring 20%. But in the New Testament, there seems to be a higher law. We know it by the thief who hung next to Jesus. And he looks over at Jesus and says, I'm deciding to obey you. Right. You got one minute left on the earth. One minute of obedience. You want me to wipe out a lifetime of your slime. And Jesus said, you got it. In a second, it was all wiped out. It's a done deal. Zacchaeus has stacked up a whole history of bad, bad stuff. He's stolen from poor people. Now, in the Old Testament, you know that if you steal from poor people, God said he'll be a curse on you. He, that violence will follow your hand, everything that you happens in your life. Now, if you do much studying on the Kennedy curse in the Kennedy family, you will hear some preachers discuss how that Joseph Kennedy, the patriarch of the tribe, made his money through poor through through liquor through days of the prohibition you'll also notice that the bible says a man that puts drink to his neighbor's mouth violence will be scheduled for his genealogy now you don't have to have the iq of a mushroom to understand the curse that's on people who walk in disobedience to the law of god in the new testament God comes back, though, whew, I have to quote the Old Testament, I go back to, though your sins be as scarlet, that should be white as snow. Though they should be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Come, let us reason together, thus saith the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. God says, let's negotiate. Let's negotiate. Hallelujah. 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 A single act of obedience, total walk in obedience. God says, I don't care what happened yesterday. All those years that you kept, you embezzled money from your company when you was 20 years old and it's 30 years later. You did this. In fact, you took off an hour early from, from, from work and you had a friend clock you out, you little thief. You said you were sick. You wasn't sick. You went to the mall. I get back into a posture of obedience and I bring God his portion and say, God, from now on, you get the 10% from here on out. He says, mm. <clears throat> yesterday is over. I remember your sins no more. Now they're buried in the sea of forgetfulness. I wipe out wrong credit, bad credit, bad decisions. Oh, hallelujah. All past theft, all my stupidity, all the times that I stole and I kept. Now, I'm a tither. I'm a tither. I walk into God's presence saying from here on out, this is your portion. I will not another day keep what belongs to you. And God said, it's over. It's a new life. Angel, throw the diary away. They got a new page. This is hallelujah. Mm. His mercies are now new every morning. That's an immediate reward. I said that's an immediate reward. The next immediate reward of tithing is authorizes God to confront your adversaries. They're sneaky, they're clever. Your enemy excels in deception. Hezbollah or Hezbollah, as some would call it, hides their machinery in Lebanon and their strategy among children and civilians. It's a known fact. They put their weaponry into factories 
And it's so hard you can't bomb them without destroying civilians because they disguise their deception in this way. If you study warfare, there are people who excel in cleverness like you excel in Christianity into purity and openness and confession and righteousness. There are people who have given their whole lives over to destroying. This is not, this battle we're in with terrorism right now, it's not between Israel and Lebanon. And I do think Iran will come down. I, I want to do that. Maybe next Sunday I'll do a world talk and I'll show you where Iran is and show you where the nations are and show you what the book of the Revelation is really about. Because there's a whole, there's a whole, this is not just happening. This is an acceleration of the end time. I believe the number system will be implemented closer than you ever dreamed. I believe the number system will be the only, only logical answer to order in the economy and going through tra traveling, etc. These 20 planes is just a hint that we, we have not even seen, we have not seen one piece of the popcorn in the little bag of, of the tricks of terrorists. There are men possessed of evil spirits, have no imprint of God, and they don't have a fear of God. You are incapable of being equal to an enemy because you have excelled in openness, they have excelled in concealment. You have excelled in truth. They have excelled in misinformation and falsehood. You were born into an adversarial environment. You're not a match for an enemy. We have weapons, but we don't have the mindset of our adversary. We build buildings, they destroy them. We preserve life. They will put a bomb on the back of their 11-year-old boy and send him to destroy five people. They will trade the life of their child for five more people. You cannot understand the negotiation suggestion shows exactly how deluded we are in the United Nations. Everything that we're doing is doing, it's a clash of belief systems. It's not a clash of nationalities. They will destroy their own people. It's a clash of belief system. It has to do with the fear of God. You have one group that has a fear of God. You have others that do not have a fear of our Jehovah. In fact, they use the replacement God in their minds. And that's a whole nother philosophy. Now, how can you survive in an adversarial environment? How can you twist your mind so much to think like evil people? You can't. You can't be racing along with, with, with confession and loving God and doing good things for people and know how to handle someone who has a strategy to sabotage and neutralize you. You can't sit down at the table and negotiate with someone who wants you to die and you're trying to let both of you live. The only two people that can agree, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? Now, this is all scriptural. So what do you do in an adversarial world? What do you do when an enemy has become skilled and clever and smart and sharp? You need somebody who knows how to deal with your enemy. You need someone who knows the mind of your enemy. You need someone who knows how to bring confusion. Now, if you recall a few days ago, an anointing came upon us here to decree confusion in the camp of the enemy. Do you remember that? Do you remember the anointing that came into this house? that the plans of adversaries and the plans of enemies, that they would run into confusion. I believe that's exactly, because it's been one week ago, I believe, or so, I believe it was exactly when the Holy Spirit let confusion come and now there was a crisscross and there was an exposure of these 20 planes that were being sabotaged. I believe what I say to God determines what God becomes willing to do for me. 
And the first thing that I thought of when I saw and realized that the plans of the enemy had gone awry, that God had moved, and it only takes just a little confusion to mess up plans, that God had allowed, because he keeps using everything he made. All these demons that used to be falling down at his feet, now he uses them for himself. He sends a spirit of confusion. He, spends, he sends a spirit. Are you seeing that? He allows, allows, he allows and he permits. Demons are still under his command. Jesus proved this. When the man was full of demons and they said, have you come to trouble us before this time? And Jesus said, I can trouble you anytime I want to. You're still under my command. You're still under my control. I still will utilize your rebellion. I still have a purpose for you. Need I study the strategies of demonic thinking? No. My part is to stay his partner. This is my list of roles. This is my list of tasks. And this is his list. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. He is my partner. What I don't bring to the table, he brings to the table. What I don't know, he knows. It's not an equal partnership for sure. I give him 10 bucks and he gives me the whole world. Anything you ask in my name, I will do it. Speak to a mountain, I'll move it into the sea. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Come help me. I will rebuke the devourer. Father, flow, come in. I will rebuke. Take your Bible right now and say, I choose to partner with you, Father. Oh, said, I choose to partner with you. Said again, I choose to partner with you. Said again, I choose to partner with you. Tithing authorizes God to give attention to anything that opposes me. Because now we're partners. God said, now you're picking on me. I'm his real estate. He said, I will protect my investment. I belong to the Most High God. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I close with this. The seventh reward, the immediate reward of tithing is it demoralizes the demons assigned to stop me. It demoralizes it instantly discourages the demon spirits who know the rewards of obedience. Let's work with the memories of demons for a moment. It is obvious that they have memories. They lost position but didn't lose their memory. A third of the angels followed Lucifer the choir director of all the universe who was so gorgeous and so beauty, so much beauty. The word says that they had so much be the most beautiful thing that God ever created was Lucifer. Now, I don't know how he became a devil without a devil to tempt him. That's been a fascination with me. How do you become evil without anybody evil in your life? But he did. Usually to fall into temptation, there needs to be a tempter. How do you become a devil without one to help you? Fascinating, isn't it? You ever think on those things, Linda? Or you just think about piano? How do you become evil without anybody evil around you? How do you self-destruct? But demons have memories. Remember that scripture? 
Jesus we know. But who are you? Demons have a memory. Purpose of memory is to replay the past. Remember the function of your mind is twofold. The memory to replay the past and your imagination to preplay your future. Demons remember what it was like to be in his presence. They've never been offered a chance to repent. They've never been offered a chance to return to God. I find that intriguing. Satan had no concept of God's mercy because he had never seen it. There had never been restoration before because there had never been a fall before. There had never been humans before. No angels were flawed. No failure in the universe. No failure anywhere. Satan becomes self-exalted, proud of himself. Maybe a third of the angels had been bragging on him how he was so gorgeous and beautiful and maybe he became self-obsessed. We don't know. All we know is that a third of the angels followed him. God created a warfare sort of as example, symbolic to show us how we can battle him. It's not that God couldn't destroy the devil. He just keeps using everything he made. Just keeps using everything he made. Now in your life, you need to see this. Satan had no memories of mercy because he had never seen mercy. He had never seen forgiveness because he had never experienced forgiveness. He got kicked out of heaven without any chance of a return. So he appears in the form of a serpent to Adam and Eve despising the beauty of the garden. God kicked him out of heaven, so he took over the earth. God puts man on the earth to drive Satan back out, and we are. And God comes back to Adam and Eve and says, I got to get you out of the garden, but I've got another plan. Can you see the head of Satan jerk like a what? What do you mean another plan? You didn't give me another plan. You didn't give me a chance to be restored. What do you mean mercy? What, what do you mean? What do you mean through the blood of bulls and goats? What do you mean a high priest? What do you mean your mercy endureth forever? I've never gotten any of your mercy. What do you mean? Can you see him? Can you imagine the complexity of this question in the councils of the damned as they all gather in here? Can you imagine that? That's why every time you say no to the devil, every time you succeed, it is like a slap in his face. See, God gave me another chance. See, God gave me another chance. And he has feelings. The invisible adversary of your life can be emotionally damaged. We can mess up his head. <laughs> he does not understand this God-human thing. He does not understand this God-man thing. He can be neutralized. He can be demoralized. He can be discouraged. And when God becomes my partner and I bring my tithe to him, that act of obedience replays the sorrow of his rebellion. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's, are you seeing that? Do you see that? Do you see? The rewards of obedience are shouted and screamed. 
that positions me for my enemy to be demoralized and lose hope. In sports, we have what we call trash talk. Michael Jordan was a master at it. Muhammad Ali was great. He'd be boxing, and a guy would hit him. He'd say, my sister can hit harder than that. <laughs> trash talking. Tiger Woods playing golf with Charles Barkley, the basketball star. And he said, did you hear about the superstore Kmart that they're moving out here? They were in Phoenix. And Charles Barkley said, no, where are they going to put it? A superstore Kmart? Yeah, he said, they're going to put it between my ball and your ball. <laughs> to demoralize his golf playing. You may not realize it, but every time you bring God what belongs to him. There is a photograph of your obedience blasted through the bulletins of your enemy. Oh, hallelujah. Your enemy becomes discouraged, demoralized, because they know the rewards of obedience. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, give God a hand clap of praise. Greater is he that is within us than he that is within the world. I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference. Right and wrong, evil and righteousness, difference in people, difference in a countenance, difference in a moment, like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? I'm so thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet, telling others about it. And I hope you're getting, by the way, I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your MP3 every single day, two minutes of wisdom. Be a blessing. Sometimes I go a little over because I get excited. I want you to be a part of this ministry. I believe that when you get involved with God, he gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive, I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. The Wisdom Quick Scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day, every single month of my life. There is no easier book to read than this Quick Scan Bible. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. Call me right now, plant your seat of 300 and watch God move.